Um, okay, so it's almost five past, so I guess suggest we get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today for today's Horizon Scanning webinar. Um, before I hand over to our host, there's just a few things I need to go through in terms of housekeeping. Um, I think everyone can hear me. Helen, would you stick a thumb up if you can hear me? Good. <laughs> um, so we'll be recording the session today, um, and I think that also means that the chat box will also be recorded. So even if it's a private chat, just in case, um, please don't put anything you wouldn't want to be recorded. Um, yeah, this will be made available through our website, the Non-Native Species Secretariat. Um, so if you know anyone that couldn't attend and wasn't able to get a ticket, it will be there um, shortly. Um, yeah, I'll mute everyone again at the start. Um, if for some reason you become unmuted, please just remute yourself so that it doesn't um, create lots of background noise and everyone can hear properly. Um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions at the end. So um, if you do think of any, if you could just write them into the chat box, I'll be monitoring this and then um, can ask them of Helen um, once the presentation's finished. And if you've got any kind of technical issues, if you suddenly can't hear, please put that in the chat box as well. I'll be monitoring that so I can keep an eye out for anything. Um, I'm just gonna add a couple more people. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Helen Roy, who has kindly agreed to do this for us. Um, Helen's going to be talking about a recent piece of work um, looking at horizon scanning for new invasive non native species threats. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to you, Helen. Great, thank you very much, Lucy, and thank you very much to the non native species secretariat for inviting me to give this um, webinar today. Can you hear me okay, Lucy? Is everything okay sound-wise for you? Perfect, great. Well, I'm so pleased that there are so many people um, within the audience, within the Zoom. Um, really welcome to you all. And I'm looking forward to your questions and your thoughts and your feedback around some of the work that we've been doing um, on horizon scanning for invasive non-native species. So I'm an ecologist at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and um, I have a lot of interest in biological invasions and um, have had some fantastic opportunities um, to carry out many different projects on them. But the one I'm going to focus on today is about um, some horizon scanning work we've been doing over the last um, year. So it's really um, current work. And of course, it's um, not just um, me that has been involved. I'm just going to check my slide has moved on okay, has it for you all? So you now should see a whole list of people. And um, many, many, many people have been involved um, in this work. And the people that are listed on this slide are those that have been involved in the GB horizon scanning work that we um, were doing leading into a workshop in December um, last year. So thank you to everyone who's been involved. But I could make this a much, much longer list um, if I was include all of those people that I've had the fantastic opportunity to work with all the way around the world, for instance, on the UK Overseas Territories horizon scanning work. And I will talk a little bit more about that um, as I go through, but to thank very much these people who have been involved in this um, latest horizon scanning work. And to thank DEFRA and the Non-Native Species Secretariat for um, their involvement within this and the funding that comes from um, DEFRA um, to do this work. So this horizon scanning study is within the context of the GB non-native species information portal and um, this is a project essentially that's been funded by DEFRA and um, with JNCC um, for many many years now and um, it's a great pleasure to be the person um, leading this project but Steph Rourke at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology is also absolutely instrumental in this as are our project partners the British Trust for Ornithology, the Marine Biological Association, the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland and many, many others, and probably many of you who've provided information um, to the information portal over the years. And this slightly complex schematic just sort of shows you how we're gathering information from lots and lots of different sources. And that information is a occurrence information of where non-native species are, and also species information, what are those species? And we pull that all into a central database, which we share through the Non-Native Species Secretariat website. And we also share that information um, through to Europe into ASIN, for example, the European system of gathering information, and also to the Global Invasive Species Database. And this information is really critical for lots and lots of different um, 
purposes um, to underpin decision making, but also to address um, scientific questions as well. So from this portal and this gathering of information, we do lots of different things and other people do lots of different things with this as well. And one of the things we do is we, on an annual basis, produce an indicator um, for the UK biodiversity indicators. And we look at um, the distribution extent of um, non-native species, the invasive component within freshwater, marine and terrestrial systems. And perhaps that's a good place for me to actually just mention the definitions that we're using here. So a non-native species, we're referring to those species that are being moved from one part of the world to another part of the world by humans. So it's that human part that's really important in that non-native species definition. When I'm referring to invasive non-native species, I'm referring to the, the, the proportion of those that cause some kind of damaging effect and, and have spread often over quite um, large areas. So within this portal we have about 2,000 species names and these are non-native species that have arrived and established within Britain and of those about 15% are known to have some kind of impact on the environment or society or economies or indeed all of those things. So this portal has lots of information on both those species that we consider to be damaging and also those species that we don't consider to, to be damaging. So that's just to give you a bit of an introduction to the non-native species information portal and you can explore it yourself um, on the website and look up some of the species that are within that um, system. But we're, current, we're always updating it so if you have any information please do get in contact with me and um, share it through that information portal. So one of the things that we have done with all of the information that we've gathered for um, Britain is to share that information into a global database and someone called Hanno Siebens from Austria has been analysing this global data set and what he's shown is that there's an accumulation in alien species worldwide so the number is going up year on year and there doesn't seem to be any sign of saturation in that pattern so there's a, an escalation in the rate of new arrivals worldwide and no sign of slowing. I think one of the other really interesting things that comes out from this work and perhaps also a concerning aspect is that when you look at these first records of species arriving somewhere else in the world there are some of them quite a high proportion. So from 2000 to 2005, 25% of those first records, there was no previous invasion um, history for them. And it's really important if, if we are to, to manage biological invasions, prevention is really the best way to do that. Of course, there are other ways we can engage in eradication and containment and other methods, but prevention is a really good way to go. But in order to put in place preventative measures, we need to get better at predicting what are these species and how are they arriving. And that leads me on to talk about um, horizon scanning. So, Back in um, 2013, we carried out a horizon scanning exercise um, for Britain. And um, when we were thinking about how can we do this, there were lots and lots of different ways that we could go about making these predictions. But actually what's really difficult is there are a lot of knowledge gaps. And in order to be able to fill those knowledge gaps, we saw that the best way to go through this process of horizon scanning was to combine the best available information that we can gather through the literature, through um, databases, but also we saw that there's a really important role here for um, expert knowledge. Not sure why my slides are flicking on, there's something going on on my screen here, I apologise for that. So we knew that there was a really important role for experts to play in terms of filling some of that gap. So we gathered groups of experts together who could cover freshwater, terrestrial and marine systems, covering plants and also animals, to work together to share the information that they have and to use a kind of structured approach of scoring for the arrival um, and also the establishment of species and also to consider the impacts they were having. And at that time, back in 2013, we just looked at biodiversity and ecosystem impacts. And we've extended the method now to consider other types of impacts as well. But essentially we have a pre-workshop 
task set of gathering lots of information within these different groups and then we bring it all together through a workshop and we have a consensus process where we exchange the information between experts from different um, disciplines so that we can begin to rank this long list of invasive non-native species that have the potential to arrive to establish and have some kind of impact. So it's really important in this horizon scanning work to have a very clearly defined scope and so our scope is Great Britain, so that's Scotland, England and Wales. But I shouldn't um, say that there has been a whole island exercise on horizon scanning as well and we're very much enjoyed sharing information between the whole of Ireland and GB and indeed across um, the whole of the EU. The temporal scope that we have been looking at is the next 10 years and we see that as being a time period over which we can make some reasonable predictions. It's not too long and it's not too short. And we've been looking at impacts primarily on um, biodiversity and ecosystems, but also more recently looking at economic and human health impacts as well. One of the things that I've worked with Olaf Boy and Jody Payton on is thinking about some of the guiding principles that we've been using within this expert elicitation process. Because when we first thought about um, doing this horizon scanning, we thought we'd follow a sort of what's called the Adelphi method, where we had sort of anonymous voting and ways of um, avoiding the bias that can happen when you have a crowd of people together. But actually we saw that that wasn't very helpful in terms of people sharing knowledge across such different disciplines and within this very complex um, questions that we're asking that we felt it's much better for experts to be able to exchange that information and so we wanted though to be really transparent about how we go about that. Defining the scope is really important and having a, a method that we follow, a structure that we follow with scoring is really important. We've also been reviewing and adapting the method. It's also critical that you have a diverse group of experts who can span all of those different environments and taxonomic groups but also have ex experts who know about human health and who are practitioners on the ground and can inform um, from some of the evidence that they will also bring to that so the diversity of experts is extremely important and then the experts need to know what they know and what they don't know and to be really honest about exchanging that information and that's how we can then begin to work together to fill some of those um, knowledge gaps by empowering all of the, ex the experts to interact, to share their experience and to capture all of that information. So we published um, a paper just sort of outlining how we've gone about these expert elicitation consensus building approaches. And um, these photos always make me smile a lot because they're from the UK um, Overseas Territories project that we did um, funded by the UK government, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office's Conflict Stability and Security Fund. And I was really delighted to um, be part of that project and meet amazing experts from all around the world to put together horizon scanning lists for all of the UK's overseas territories and I learned so much um, through that process. So in terms of our previous horizon scanning work that we've done I've already mentioned that um, back in 2013 and published in 2014 we carried out this process for um, Great Britain. We then were really fortunate to have um, funding to carry out this um, same approach for the whole of the European Union and um, we published that a few years later. I've already mentioned the UK overseas territories work um, that we've done and um, we've published the work there for um, Cyprus, for the Cyprus SBAs, but also more recently for the um, Antarctic um, Peninsula region. And um, we're looking forward to um, publishing those more widely as well, but the report is available on the Secretariat's um, website. So then thinking about how is this information used, because I think this is really just the very first step in a much, much longer process. So we produce these um, prioritized, if you like, or ranked lists of invasive non-native species following this process and with that particular scope. And for example, the European Commission have used that list in part for prioritizing species then for risk assessment, and then to be able to make some decisions around which species might appear on the list of um, union concern. 
but they can also be immediately used for implementing um, monitoring and action. And, and Olaf Boy recently led a paper using the list that we had um, derived for Europe to look at structured eradication feasibility um, assessments. So that can be another way in which um, these lists are used. And also for enhancing biosecurity. So um, the paper that we published for the Antarctic Peninsula has now been put forward um, for the Secretary of the Antarctic Treaty to consider whether it will have wider applicability for other of um, the peninsula territories. So I think there's lots of different ways in which this information can be used. So one of the things that we have done in the 2019 um, exercise where we all came together for a workshop in December was to extend the scope. So we had been looking at biodiversity and ecosystem impacts. So these are things such as looking at mussels, which are ecosystem engineers and can have cascading effects throughout whole systems and really alter the community um, dynamics within a particular system. We've also been looking now more recently at human health. And of course, mosquitoes are a very obvious example of a, um, some introduced invasive non-native species that can have quite profound human health impacts by um, vectoring disease. And also um, extending this to consider economic impacts as well. And in this context and um, on Plant Health Week, that's a particular relevance, thinking about those species that really have quite profound plant health impacts. So to do this, we've been trying to have some kind of definitions around these different types of impacts and assigning a score for them. And that kind of gives us the first way in which we can rank these very, very long lists of species. So I think just as an example for the UK overseas territories, we were looking at thousands and thousands of species and trying to distill that down to lists of tens that can perhaps provide that very critical priority list for um, subsequent decision making. So we use this um, scoring process oh, and I just realized that second two should actually say three so I do apologize for that we don't have two twos on the scoring list so we score from one to five with five being the highest um, impact and one being the lowest impact but one of the things we do as well is we acknowledge this is a very screwed scoring system and it's just to give us a first point at which we can begin to order the list but we do have some definitions going from for example on the biodiversity and ecosystems a score of one would be no sort of deleterious impacts or very local short-term impacts on very few species and that they might be reversible. Whereas when we get to the score of five, we're thinking of much more widespread and severe long-term impacts, and it might include the extinction of species, certainly would include changes to ecosystem function and consequently the services that an ecosystem might provide. So just thinking about the biodiversity and ecosystem impacts to give an example. So this is on St. Helena and this is Eleanor Chikorika and Niall Moore and they are holding the New Zealand flax um, fronds here. That was a difficult thing to say. And um, it was really um, starting to see the invasion by New Zealand flax on St. Helena covering really large areas and really altering um, the systems and that are there on um, St. Helena. So very obvious impacts that can be seen. But just to also mention that very recently the IUCN has published um, a system, the Environmental Impact Classification for Alien Taxa system, that allows um, people to have a framework for quantifying impacts. And so you may be interested um, in taking a look at that. When it comes to socioeconomic impacts, I found um, this slide in the Non-Native Species Secretariat Gallery of Olaf and um, some giant hogweed. And um, we know that the um, giant hogweed, for example, can have impacts on um, by being photoreactive in terms of some of the substances and causing skin problems as a consequence um, of that. And another paper that you might be interested in looking at is this one on socioeconomic impact classification of alien taxa. This is a much more recent publication than the environmental impact classification system, but we'd be really grateful to have thoughts and feedback on it and, and how useful it might be um, to you in providing a framework for quantifying some of those social economic impacts. 
So just looking um, at the list that we produced by going through the horizon scanning exercise last year um, for GB, when we look at the biodiversity and ecosystem impacts, we came up with a list of 100 species that we were able to put into quite kind of discrete bands. So we have a top 10, an 11 to 20, 21 to 30, and so on, all through up to the sort of 51 to 100. With the human health impacts, it was a much shorter list, and similarly, the economic impacts, it was a much shorter list. We were able to come up with a top five for both of those, but also, we then had um, a longer list of six to 20 for the human health. And um, we don't always have a round number, it should be said. So um, in this case, six to 21 um, for the economic um, impacts. And one of the things that we decided to do, we obviously have all of these lists separately, but um, just in discussion with Nao Moore and Olaf Boy and others, we thought it would be really useful to have a combined list where we pull all of the different impacts and see if we can agree as a group of experts on a kind of top impact list and so that might include species that maybe have a really catastrophic biodiversity and ecosystem impact but a much lower impact on human health and economic impacts or it might be a species that would have quite sort of moderate impacts across all of those different categories. So it's quite a tricky thing to do, but nevertheless, we have come up with a list of a top 30 that we all agreed with some caveats um, that um, would constitute our combined list. And we have a top 15 and then a 16 to 30 um, for that. So it is important to note that many of the invasive non-native species actually have multiple impacts. So it's, it's possibly quite unusual that you just have one species causing one kind of impact. So um, in the case of this um, Myriophyllum, that um, it has biodiversity um, and ecosystem impacts by invading waterways and changing um, the community dynamics, changing physical aspects of that um, system as well. But in terms of then causing economic problems in altering the sort of economic value value or recreational use of a particular waterway, it then has other impacts as well. So I thought it would just be interesting to look at the, this combined impact list and you can see all of the other lists, they'll be available on the um, Non-Native Species Secretariat um, website. First, Pavelatina, the Asian hornet, I know we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, um, comes up on many of the lists quite high up and it was certainly ranked very highly within our combined list. So this order of the species here is not meant to indicate in any way that Vespa velatina is of a higher order, um, for example, than the um, corbicula. These are all sort of ranked in an even band of 1 to 15. But I just thought I'd highlight those that potentially have the, um, or do have plant health implications, so the Asian longhorn beetle and also the emerald ash borer. But what you can see throughout this list is it's diverse, the species spanning the marine, the terrestrial and the freshwater systems, and it's taxonomically diverse um, as well. So then just to look at our slightly lower ranked list, but still very important up there in our top 30. Um, again, I've highlighted those um, that are of plant health concern with um, the brown marmorid stink bug, the European spruce bark beetle, citrus longhorn beetle, and the prime sessionary moth. But again, you can see there's a lot of diversity um, there, both taxonomically and also environmentally. So I thought I would just um, turn to the Asian hornet um, for a short while. So Vespa velatina, we put it really high up on our list um, within 2013, and also it's still appearing on our list in 2019. In 2013, it probably wasn't really rocket science for us to put the Asian hornet high up on the list because it had already arrived in France and was spreading quite rapidly and there were big concerns about the impacts that it would have on honeybees, but also on other pollinating insects as well. And there's a lot of information and 
evidence that pollinating insects generally are struggling quite a bit at the moment for a whole variety of reasons. And so the thought of the Asian hornet arriving and causing further problems um, was really very concerning. It's a terrestrial predator. It does have um, a particular tendency to feed on um, honeybees, but it does have quite a wide um, diet breadth and will feed on a whole variety of pollinating insects of wild bees and also hoverflies and many other insects as well. It's native to China and a completely random event, it arrived in a pottery consignment into um, France. So following the 2013 um, horizon scanning list, um, we, um, with support from um, DEFRA and the non native Species Secretariat and the National Bee Unit and others set up the Asian Hornet Alert System with Agent, the Asian Hornet Watch app. But we also have um, an email system where people can report their sightings of concern when they think they've seen an Asian Hornet, they have somewhere that they can um, report that sighting. And we've had lots of publicity around the Asian hornet. Many people have um, given lots of information to raise awareness about the problem of Asian hornets and the beekeeping community have been fantastic in terms of um, being on the lookout and also um, getting more people to send in their sightings. So that's really fantastic. But what it's meant is that year on year, and you can see on this um, graph here, that we've seen more and more reports coming in of people thinking that they've seen Asian hornets. Actually, there's only been a handful of actual confirmed sightings and all of those um, have been successfully eradicated. So you may have seen in the news over the last few weeks that there was a confirmed um, sighting in Hampshire and um, that has subsequently been eradicated. But when you look at the, um, the numbers of um, sightings that we receive. So this is the um, 2020 curve. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but you can see the 2020 curve. It's the, the big peak. And I'm sure lockdown had um, some, con some consequences in terms of making that um, a bigger peak than in previous years. But it's fantastic that people are so engaged with sending in their sightings. Um, but of course, there's only um, a handful that actually turn out to be confirmed and in fact at that particular time at the earlier run in the year there were none of the sightings were actually confirmed. So every year there have been records in GB of the Asian Hornet since um, 2016 but every year there's been a fantastic response um, from the, the National Bee Unit and from the AFA teams who've been out and eradicated um, the Asian Hornet. And to thank all of those people who sent in their suspected sightings, because that's what gives us the um, ability to be able to um, send that information through for that eradication um, campaign. But one of the things we've also been doing very recently is using data from other parts of um, Europe to look at predicting the spread of the Asian hornet. To think about where would the Asian hornet have been had that eradication not taken place um, when it took place. And I've listed the people who've been leading um, this work here, Louise Barwell, Olaf Boy, Richard Hassel, Beth Peart and Steph Rourke have been absolutely instrumental to this. And also um, Simone Liu from Italy as well, who's been working alongside us on a, on a broader European project. But through this modeling work um, that we have been um, doing, whoops, sorry about that, um, we've been able to show that there would be really quite extensive spread um, had there not been that eradication and that would be quite rapid spread that by 2026 you can see on this um, second map that there would have been um, spread throughout the south of England into the south of Wales and up into the Midlands and moving towards the north of England as well. And looking at the environmental suitability map on the other side with the, the greens and the oranges, you can see that our predictions are that there's a, a, a large part of, um, of the UK that would be suitable for the Asian hornet. So the eradication side has been really critical in um, preventing this spread and then the subsequent impact that we would have, we would have seen on um, the pollinating insects. 
So just to um, summarize, it's really important that um, we refine our tools and techniques for predicting invasions and that we can do this with modeling, but also with these expert elicitation horizon scanning approaches. But these are all first steps and the communication and raising awareness and getting people involved in keeping a lookout for um, the invasive non-native species and reporting them are absolutely critical. And indeed, in terms of looking across impacts and thinking about human health and economic impacts, as well as by diversity and ecosystem impacts means we really need to have collaborations across disciplines and not just disciplines in terms of the academic disciplines but also in terms of practitioners on the ground and it leads me to say thank you to all of those many people who have been involved um, with this work and um, have brought that diversity and interdisciplinary um, research to our studies and to thank all of the, the funders and also to mention that the IPBES Invasive Species Global Assessment is open for review at the moment and you can find out more about that on the IPBES um, website, but there's lots of opportunities to get involved. So thank you all very much for listening. Sorry that my slides get moving forward. I don't know why they were doing that, um, but thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Helen, for a fascinating talk. Um, yeah, a brilliant piece of work and really useful for us as well in terms of prioritising um, which species and pathways to focus on for biosecurity and prevention. Um, if anyone would like to see the list of the top 30, it's on our website. Um, so if you go to the homepage, there's a news item and it um, will link you through to it. I've just updated it. Um, Most a few questions, so I'll have a look at those. Um, if anyone has any, please do just put them in the chat box. Um, sorry. So... A couple from Stan Whitaker. Um, so, were invasive species already covered by animal health and plant health regimes scoped out of the assessment? Yes, so we did um, have various people involved in um, providing the lists and in terms of the lists that we began to start with we we pulled from all kinds of different sources from the global invasive species databases from ASIN from plant health lists from a whole variety of um, different lists contributed um, to our eventual prioritization list okay. so they were incredibly valuable yes thank you <laughs> um, and how does the criteria for scoping impacts differ from the IUCN's environmental impact classification of alien taxa um, I can't that's it that's a really excellent um, question. We tried to follow the ICAT as much as possible, but I wouldn't say we followed it in the really strict way that the ICAT classification um, recommends. So we followed the definitions and the criteria quite quite closely. Um, but um, in terms of um, the ICAT system to follow it through, it's very, very evidence. It is evidence-based in terms of providing that kind of peer-reviewed evidence base. Whereas, of course, we're relying on quite a lot on expert um, knowledge as well. So that sort of makes it a little bit different from following the ICAT process, but mostly we follow the ICAT definitions quite closely. Yeah. Then um, Andrew Griffith says that the prediction of spread model and graph is brilliant. Has that been done for other species? Oh, I'm really delighted that you say that and you enjoy that because this is work that we've been doing um, throughout lockdown as well and it's been really exciting um, to work with the modelers for this and I think what's exciting is the way in which we're combining these environmental suitability models with spread models and there's a very good kind of mechanistic underpinning to all of this so we're taking in a lot about the species biology so we are doing going to be using these models for a whole variety of other species as well and um, we'll be reporting to DEFRA next March with the models for, for species. We've chosen some that are in aquatic systems, we've chosen plants as well as animals, vertebrates as well as invertebrates and um, what we try to create is a, a modeling framework that allows us to be to generalize and use it for a variety of different types of taxa in different types of contexts while still keeping enough information that hopefully there's some realism to them as well so i'm very pleased that you you like those and um yep yeah, it's just the start um but we're just beginning now um to model some of the other species like bullfrogs and um Myriophyllum, for example. Um, so yeah, we'll be publicizing that soon. Perhaps I'll give another webinar when we've done that. <laughs> um, are there any algae posing similar risks apart from seaweeds? 
That's a really good question. And I think what that does is highlight to me to mention our sort of knowledge gaps. And um, there for sure will be other algae and we need to consider those more broadly. Um, we did have um, Ju Juliet Brody involved in our high-rise scanning. She's absolutely fantastic on the um, seaweed side. And I think she would say that we need to bring more algal experts into this horizon scanning. And I would say that that does highlight that we do have um, knowledge gaps in that way in terms of the sort of experts that we bring together. And um, we do make sure that we acknowledge those the best that we can. But yeah, um, I think that we could go far, we go a lot further with looking at some of these specific um, groups. Um, so yes. And Juliet Brody would agree, I know, that we could extend it further on the algal side. Um, do you see or hope to see more funding for tackling invasive species coming from the private sector in future? So places like shipping companies and port authorities? Oh, that's a really good question. So I'm very naive at not really thinking about where the funding comes from at times and just um, enjoying doing the science behind the scenes. Um, so I haven't really given that a great deal of thought as to where um, the funding is likely to come from. I'm enjoying a project at the moment working with the European Commission and working with lots of different um, stakeholders from different sectors to consider perceptions and understanding around um, invasive non-native species. And I think certainly something that we could do more with the different sectors would be to be um, raising awareness and helping um, people to have a greater understanding of um, the ways in which some of the actions associated with some of these industries might be unintentionally introducing um, species of concern. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, we'd have to give some more thought around the funding part. It's not something I thought about so much, but it's a good question and definitely engaging stakeholders much more broadly um, within um, discussions on invasive non-native species and their prevention and control is really important. Um, another one, so great talk as ever, ever Helen, sorry. Um, is the data available at regional level? It would be re really useful to use alongside the regional invasive species, invasive species management plans. So they're the plans that are produced through the Rapid Life Project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another really excellent question. And I think we could definitely look at a regional level in terms of sort of looking at lists, um, Scotland, England and Wales um, separately, for instance. And as I mentioned already, there has been a whole island horizon scanning as well. Um, so yeah, I think that there's a lot more that we could do um, in that way. And also thinking about the different sectors and species that are of interest in different um, sectors as well. I think that's um, yeah, really, really excellent um, question. Um, I've got another response, oh hang on, uh, it's just skipping up, um, from Scottish Natural Heritage to that. So they're planning to repeat the horizon scanning for Scotland this year. Great, that's fantastic and yeah hopefully our list will be useful but it's a really iterative and dynamic process and we look forward to hearing um, the comments coming back and actually one of the reasons we've submitted these lists for peer review in sort of the academic literature is in part to have that kind of sense check from other people out there too um, because you know we're bringing together very big groups of experts and I think that that does mitigate and um, manage some of the uncertainty but of course this whole process there is quite a lot of uncertainty about the future um, and so it's really good to have as many possible takes on that um, as, the, as, as people would like to put forward. Um, <laughs> someone intrigued to see raccoon and raccoon dog in the top 15 list. Are they such a high concern because of animals already here or due to risk of more coming in um, and if the latter any idea how they would come over? Yeah, so actually raccoons and raccoon dogs often are the ones people do mention as being perhaps surprising. And of course, there are a lot in captivity and escapes do happen. And I think it was somebody from the pet industry who once told me that, you know, these are animals that are really great. At, they're great escapists. So um, they, you know, they, in a sense, they are here and they are in captivity. And I should have said that when we're on this work, we only look at those species that are currently absent in the wild so to speak, um, within this, this, and that causes some problems for the plant experts, actually, we could talk more about that another time. But yeah, so it's to do with the escape that, and also, you know, we know already that there are countries across Europe where um, raccoons, for instance, and raccoon dogs are causing quite a lot of problems. And given the um, current um, pandemic, 
there's also an increased awareness around disease, for instance. And we know that um, raccoon dogs, for instance, do harbour a number of zoonoses. And so, you know, from the human health perspective, that's um, really important to consider um, as well. Um, in your opinion, what are the main challenges regarding the methods used in horizon scanning? So I think you need always knowledge gaps are a problem, but it's always inspiring to see how the experts come together and work imaginatively but robustly to fill those gaps. So looking at sort of analog species, if you like, to be able to think about, well, we don't know much about this species, but we do know about this closely related species. And so inferring from that. And of course we document all of those discussions as much as we can so that we can be as transparent and open around some of those gaps that we have. But yeah, knowledge gaps are, are that is a big problem. Of course, when we're working on these lists as well, we're looking, we're, you know, we're comparing plants and animals and we're comparing different systems that they might arise, arrive within. And so, of course, that also um, is, is very challenging, but very exciting. When we're in the workshops, you know, there's very, very lively discussions between experts around whether this species is a worse species than that species. And um, I think that's the sort of beauty of this expert elicitation approach is that bringing together people from different disciplines and sharing that information, you really see the sort of richness um, of evidence that comes out from that. So it's really exciting. But, you know, over time, we'll have more and more information on, um, on these different species. And you know, I think there is a real need for more evidence of impacts and um, empirical evidence for impacts. So that for example, um, with the Asian hornet, that we can learn lessons from what's being seen in the Channel Islands, for instance, or across France, and that we share that information around um, that emerging evidence. Um, and it's, yeah, it is exciting year on year. There's a lot more information out there that we can bring together to make this a more and more robust process. So this one's following on from the funding question earlier. Um, so this person tried to get an Asian hornet awareness raising project off the ground in Kent as they're concerned by the degree of mis misidentification of European hornets. Um, they've not been successful yet in getting funding for this, so perhaps your data on spread will help them to highlight this issue. Oh, so not so much a question, but another use for the data. Yeah, well, I'm really pleased that it will, will be useful. And there are some really fantastic resources available that you can use as well to highlight the risk. But I think these local campaigns are really important. And mm -hmm. I think that it's much more compelling to a, a local community to hear from others within that community about the risk than it is probably to hear from some from me talking about a, a very sort of looking at a national um, picture. Um, so I'm really delighted to hear that you're doing that promotion work. And just to say how really important important it is even to get this, the, the, the pictures of the European hornets because it gives us that knowledge that there are people out, um, they are looking and we kind of get that background level of intensity of recording that's going on um, which helps us around thinking about how the detectability issues if you like. Um, so I'm really delighted to hear that you're um, pursuing funding um, for that um, local campaign. And if there's any ways in which um, we can help, just, just let us know. And um, I know there's lots of fantastic resources on the Non-Native Species Secretariat website that Lucy oversees on the communication side um, that, that will be valuable to you. Uh, a question from Brazil this time. Um, so they're planning to apply horizon scanning to define a list of alert species to be used by environmental agencies, among others, in order to define vigilance and preparedness activities. Do you have any advice for someone who's just starting the process? So I think gathering together um, a, a, a good group of experts with diversity in um, sort of taxonomic understanding, but also in terms of sort of from different um, so from people who are sort of conservation practitioners through to the people who have the taxonomic understanding of the, the different species and the ecology. So bringing together those experts is a really, really good um, starting point. And then there are a lot of data sources out there that you can begin with. So for example, it may be that the UK Overseas Territories Horizon Scanning lists that we have um, published on the Secretariat website might be a really good starting point for you to kind of go through that list and think about those species and their relevance um, to you um, in Brazil. 
but if you have any any questions at all on how we've gone about our method i mean we have published it in the different papers and um but of course there still will be questions from that um we'd be really happy to answer them and in, indeed we we have done so for other regions so for example um horizon scanning activities that have taken place in other parts of the world um we're always really happy if there's ways in which the methods that we've been using can be of value to others elsewhere in the world and also we'll then learn from you you can come back to us and tell us what worked for you um, that you did differently um, and um, we'll be able to refine our methods as well so good luck with that that sounds exciting um oh another one um so this time from india uh they're planning to do a horizon scanning of exotic species of freshwater fish of western ghats do you have any advice would that be the same sort of advice as before yeah, it would be the same sort of advice. And of course, by reducing your scope to that um, very specific question, then hopefully you'll be able to get even more um, information. You know, you'll be able to have a sort of experts with even deeper understanding for your particular system. Um, and there are some really excellent frameworks out there that specifically look at impacts in freshwater systems as well. And there are some really great databases um, of information on the um, aquatic species that you could look at and if you want to have more information on those sources just drop me an email and um, I can point you in the right direction but the Global Invasive Species Database also has a whole long list of um, sources of information that might be valuable to you. Um, does anybody have any final questions? Just give a minute for those. Um, yeah I'll give them a second but I'll say a huge thank you to Helen for volunteering to do this not even forced into it. Um, yeah it's been a brilliant talk. I'm always really happy to share um, what I think is really exciting work and um, always really delighted to be working in partnership with the Non-Native Species Secretariat um, to try and make the work that we're doing as, as relevant as, as possible. But yeah, any questions if you have afterwards, you can always drop me an email um, and um, I'm very happy to, to chat more. Um, oh, I suppose a quick one. Do you have an idea when the paper will be published for this? So we want to, that as well. yeah, we always try and do it as rapidly as possible. So I will say that um, I would hope that we would submit this paper in maybe four months time and then also then it's reliant on the review process. But within the next year, the paper should be published um, comfortably within the next year, I would hope. Um, it's really important to us to share the information as widely as we possibly can so it can be of value to as many people as possible but also as i said that that process is a really important sense check of what we've done and to receive the criticisms from others um, so we can improve going forward is really important too brilliant um there's lots of thank yous in the chat box but i don't think there are any more questions so uh yeah i think that's everything well, thank you all. It's been just wonderful to, to be with you all. And um, thank you very much, Lucy, for organising everything and um, for going along with my volunteering and, and inviting me to do this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Helen. Uh, this will be available on our website shortly on the Horizon Scanning page. So check out the list and check this out and share it when it's ready. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you all.